Hello. So um, I am going to talk about women in war and World War II. A lot of times when we talk about war and really the way war was created was man's work. But World War II was a really pivotal time. And as I've done this book, I see that it was a time that really changed things for our society and how women operated in our, in our world and in our society. So the way I came to this book was my mother was in Saipan during World War II. Uh, she started World War II in, at Northwestern University. She was a student and I saw, yeah, um, I went there too. And so, <laughs> um, and so she started there and then she was an editor at Reader's Digest. She was one of the first females who, she had a master's degree in journalism and they would have hired her as a secretary, but because men had gone off to war, they actually hired her as an assistant editor. So it was the first generation of women who actually were more qualified than many of the men, but they got to be actual editors. Um, so I knew that about my mother, and I knew she had been in World War II, and I knew there was a lot that she had experienced, but I really didn't know the full extent until after she died. And I found shoeboxes of letters that she had written home to her own parents in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, and this is what they looked like. She took her portable typewriter to Saipan with her and typed these single-spaced, sp single you know, this onion skin paper. And these are, this is uh, Tuesday, July 10th, 1945. So um, that really intrigued me. It got me thinking about it. And then what I did was I put them in chronological order and I read every single one. So she, re she wrote a letter pretty much once a week to her parents. And it started in Chicago at Northwestern and then in New York City for a couple of years and then uh, to Saipan, Hawaii and Saipan. And um, my mother was also uh, a war bride. She and her first husband, not my father, were married in 1942. And he had been hired the year before as an editor at Reader's Digest. And he went off to war and my mother literally took his job. Um, <laughs> and so I knew that. His name was Tom Hagen and he wrote a book, a World War II book called Mr. Roberts. Yeah, and it was uh, made into a film with James Cagney and Jack Lemmon um, and Henry Fonda and it's dedicated to my mother. So I also had some of his letters and her letters uh, to him. No, I guess I, I had some of them. Anyway, I had his letters to her during the war, and I had her letters to her parents writing about how he didn't treat her right. So <laughs> it was a really eye-opening thing as a daughter to meet your mother before she was your mother, and that's what I got to do. So what I want to do today is show you what, what I learned from this was that what we were taught about World War II and particularly about women, um, it was never told from their point of view. And that's why I did this book. I wanted to treat the women as equals, not as the women left behind or the keeping the high home fires burning. And what does that even mean, you know? So um, what I'll do is tell you a little bit about uh, my mother a little bit more, and then um, I'm going to show you a video from CBS Sunday Morning when my book came out, and I'll tell you about that. And then after, I'm going to read you some excerpts because a lot of what this book was based on were letters from the time. And some of us were talking the other day, I don't know what you're going to do about this, this era when uh, hopefully, you know, ho I'm hoping that a lot of the texts and emails and Facebook posts will be saved somehow for historians. So that's a, that's a challenge. Um, but that was the most immediate thing, was really being able to feel that time. I interviewed a lot of women, I did all of that, but really being able to read what they said and wrote and thought at the time as women was really eye-opening. So, here we go. Uh, <laughs> so, when my mother joined the Red Cross, um, 
I'll read you what she said about it, but in order to be in the Red Cross in World War II, you had to be 25 years old and you had to have a college degree. And then you were sent overseas to serve coffee and donuts. <laughs> so if you think about it, the talent and the exuberance that they put into that, those were some amazing Red Cross clubs. Because I read my mother's letters about setting them up, and I mean, she put everything into it. And then the other thing about Red Cross is that the women who wrote their letters, were they were really good letters. And she also kept a journal, and I had pictures. So it was, it was really illuminating. Um, but I want to read you, when she made the decision to go to the Red Cross, I'll read you the, what she wrote to her parents. Um, and this is a letter where she's trying to describe why she's going, and her husband is, is Tom, Tom Hagen. And I said... You know, I found a new perspective, and this is me writing. I said, I found it in letters like the one to her parents dated January 4th, 1945, in which my mother, then 23, tried to explain her decision to leave Reader's Digest and join the Red Cross. This is my mom. Hope you can see how the Digest life is almost too perfect with the world and the sorry mess it's in. I just have to get out and try to do something active and direct, when so many other people are doing so much. It's not enough for me to say that my husband is doing it, and that's my part in the war. I want to do something myself. Do you see what I mean? And then, I, this is me writing, I said, my grandparents did understand and wrote back supporting her move. But in her grappling with that decision, I was learning what a huge step joining the Red Cross had been for her. In her next letter, I also recognized a younger version of the woman I remember who organized Equal Rights Amendment rallies in the 1970s and 1980s. The letter, dated January 8, 1945, showed prevailing attitudes about women and being a wife that my mother and many other women faced down during the war. So this is what she wrote back to her parents. You see, when I decided to do this, I anticipated that lots of people was, w would think I was doing a pretty foolish thing. I'm finding that lots of people who don't know the facts of the case think just that. Julie's husband, Ken, for example, who's one of those people who thinks that the only reason any girl joins the Wax, Waves, or Red Cross, or any other such thing, is just to have a wonderful time and meet lots of men. He thinks I must be a pretty unstable sort of war wife who doesn't keep the home fires burning. And I expect that many other people, when I announce the decision more publicly, will have the same reaction. But I'm prepared for it. I don't expect everyone to heartily approve of what I'm doing. But now that I know that the people who matter most, my parents and Tom's parents, think I'm doing the right thing, I have the moral reinforcement that I really do need. And I'll be able to go ahead with it now with so much greater peace of mind and really work for what I'm trying to accomplish. Establish a better and broader basis of understanding between Tom and me, while at the same time doing something direct and satisfying in the war effort. And in those words, as I went further into this, that really guided me, and that is so much uh, of, of what I heard from other women. But there are also other reasons, and they're not usually the reasons we think of. It wasn't just, you know, standing by your man or fighting or whatever. It was also economic opportunities that suddenly opened up for women that they had never had before. And I had letters, or I had interviews as well, of people saying, women saying, that was the first time I ever had my own paycheck, and the feeling of that. And then there's a woman who talked about the first time she ever wore pants was during World War II. So little things are really... Uh, what change is made of. It's not always these epic moments. It's little things adding and adding up and adding up. And I think in particular uh, for women, because they had to kind of keep quiet about what was going on, because it was the men's, and we had to support the men, and we had to... So, you know, they weren't on the battlefields. They weren't allowed. And so if people are dying on the battlefields, some of whom are their brothers, husbands, fathers, um, they were very much a part of this. So. That's kind of the theme you'll see. So what I want to do is talk about 1940s America. Think about this. What were the roles that women played? I'm going to read you a list of, of job titles from World War II and just 
let the first thing come in your mind. We're in 1940s America. Saxophone player, welder, member of Congress, cabinet secretary, undercover spy, war correspondent, American Nazi tried for sedition, radio disc jockey, lawyer at the Nuremberg trials, comic book superhero, resistance worker in Germany beheaded by Hitler, marine baseball player. Probably, for me, the, the images of men, but those are all women in my book. Those are all roles that women stepped into, and a lot of them for the first time. So I like to think of these women without really knowing it, they were pioneers. I don't think they set out to do it, but there it was, and they did. And so that's the exciting part of this. Um, I think we did them a great disservice, though, as a country, because when they came back, they didn't talk about it, um, even more so in, in some ways than the men. And in fact, I realized that some of what women went through, especially the women who joined the military, it was the first time women were allowed in the military, uh, they didn't talk about it. And so it was much like Vietnam when they came back and they just went on and, and kind of ignored it. Um, so if you can keep all of this in your mind as we talk more, I want to show you a video um, that was uh, on CBS Sunday Morning. And it started, um, it, it came out in 2004. Is the video person here? Is, oh, there he is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't see you. Um, it came out in 2004 in May, and it was, I was very excited. You know, your book is coming out. It's going to be on CBS Sunday morning. It's great. Um, and I got a call the night before. Ronald Reagan had died. And so they said, we're not sure we're going to run it tomorrow. But it was also the 60th anniversary of D-Day. And so I thought, you know, I don't... So anyway, the mor that morning, the producer called me and she said, it's going to run in the 9 o'clock hour. It's the only thing we're going to do except for... It's going to be all eulogies for Reagan except for this story. So when you see it, at the very end, they do a preview of something about Reagan coming up. So you'll see at the end, and I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it as the punchline. Um, also, uh, my mother was not a Reagan fan. Um, and so what I thought when this happened was I thought, she's, she's smiling because she was the only thing that morning <laughs> that interrupted the eulogies for Ronald Reagan. Um, and then also you'll see the book that, I, that shows up is the hardcover, but I like the paperback better because I like the cover, but also this is my mom, and this is my mom in Saipan, and they finally agreed to put it on the cover. So, so we'll play the video, and then I'll talk after. It's Sunday morning on CBS, and here again is Anthony Mason. Today's D-Day ceremonies are a tribute to the thousands of young men who stormed the Normandy beaches 60 years ago. Which is not to say that the women of America made no contribution to the Allied victory. Our early show colleague, Harry Smith, has their story. Beverly, the music here, the jukebox is stuffed to the cuff, the Yanks all around the world are waiting for the words and music now. Well, thanks, Lou Crosby, and hi there, men from the USA. During World War II, the radio wake-up call American GIs in the States, in the Pacific, and in Europe all tuned into was Reveille with Beverly. I've just finished loading the turntables with platters that are busting with bounce. It was an unusual voice for a disc jockey because it was a woman's voice. I just loved Vic in front of that microphone. What did it mean to you to be able to perform that service? for all those boys. I, w I knew from the first moment to the last moment I was the luckiest girl in the world. Her real name was Jean Ruth, and while Beverly was not a perfect rhyme with Reveille, it was close enough, and it was Jean Ruth's voice that helped America's far-flung forces feel a little closer to home. She said she never had to write a word of the show, she'd just read their letters. I'm just one of the many B-17 pilots here in England, and if anyone puts us back on our home soil, you do it. 
Their letters were sensational. Mostly humor and love. And I always put the requests from the hospitals on the top of the stack. Beverly was a part of World War II's greatest generation, but she was also one of the war's legions of unsung heroes, the women. The women stepped up whatever they were asked to do, whatever they were invited to do, whatever they were allowed to do, they did. And I called it an inadvertent revolution. Emily Yellen has written a book called Our Mother's War. It tells of the struggles and the successes of the millions of women during World War II who didn't just keep the home fires burning. They changed the course of the nation they had been left to tend. Well, I didn't set out to prove that this was the seeds of the li women's liberation movement or anything, but it's so clear to me now. The seeds were planted. So I would meet a woman, and she was a riveter in, during World War II, let's say, and maybe she went back you know, home after the war, raised a family, and, and never went back to work. But then I'll meet her daughter, and she's a lawyer, you know, or a doctor. Or a journalist, an author like Yellen herself. Yes. Yellen's own mother, Carol Lynn, became an editor at Reader's Digest during the war. She said I was an editorial Rosie the Riveter. Because you wouldn't have gotten it had men not gone off to war. Exactly, exactly. Then in early 1945, her mother set off on her greatest adventure. Carol Lynn joined the Red Cross and soon was sent to Saipan. But her daughter grew up never hearing much about it. At our family dinner table, we talked about my father being in Burma, and that was our talk about World War II. When she was 79 years old, Carol Lynn Yellen died of cancer in 1999. About a year later, Emily was rummaging through the attic when she discovered dozens of time-stained letters most of them typed on onion skin paper and still folded neatly in their original airmail envelopes. What was the most important thing you learned about your mother from going through all those letters? I don't think that I had realized what, a, what courage it took to do what she did. What a great leap it was for a young woman from Oklahoma to make a decision to go to war and it really showed me the roots of everything I knew about her. Guided by her mother's words, Yellen embarked on a journey to learn more about other women's mothers. I think there was a can-do, we have to all pitch in attitude, and people weren't concerned with getting credit, they were concerned with getting things done and winning the war, and whatever it took. And when the call went out that the military was in need, Lillian Goodman was one of the hundreds of thousands of women who responded. Did you have any hesitation at all about this? No. I was just thrilled with the idea of being able to do something for our country. I, I don't know, I guess I was too dumb to be scared. <laughs> In 1943, she became a WASP, which stood for Women Air Force Service Pilots. WASP were civilians and not sent overseas. Most of the time, they ferried planes to and from factories and bases around the country. And to do that, they had to look for landmarks on the ground to guide their course. It was what we call contact flying. And it was a wonderful time in America because every town had a water tower with its name painted on it in real big letters. In three years, WASP managed to fly some 60 million miles and ferried more than 12,000 planes, some in disrepair. That alone was dangerous work, but there was more. They also provided target practice for the men. We were co-piloting B-26 bombers, which, were, which had a very bad reputation. They were called widow makers mm -hmm. because they were difficult to fly and difficult to land. So you were flying the B-26, yes. trailing the target yes. behind yes. on a tether. That's the very word. Right. And so then the ones, the students in the B-17s would come and try and shoot it down. And believe me, we, we let it go out at full distance. <laughs> All the day long, with the rain or shine, she's aboard of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, 
Some men resented women coming into the workforce. Harassment was not uncommon, but rarely reported, and sometimes it was deadly. In the Wasp, for example, some women had suspicious accidents. It's hard to say how many involved foul play because most incidents were not investigated. Still, the Wasps continued their work until the unit was unceremoniously disbanded in 1944. Lillian Goodman never flew an airplane again. She went back home and a few years later got married and had a family. Any regrets then as you went off and became a homemaker and was there a part of you that thought woulda, coulda, shoulda? I'm not a person who looks back and wants to change things. Right. And someone said, well, you had to sacrifice. It was no sacrifice, it was all pleasure. Emily Yellen says most of the women of Goodman's generation have that kind of spirit. I started to recognize my own mother in all these other women that I spoke to and that I read about. You know, the song Accentuate the Positive. It's sort of a silly song and, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I remember thinking Accent my mother... Accentuate the positive, right? Right. Eliminate the negative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that song came to me as I, as I was talking to some of these women. You got to accentuate the positive that positive attitude was their armor. That was how they handled this. That was how they met the world. Because there was a lot of pressure on women not to be angry, to be very feminine, and keep going without knowing when it's going to end, without knowing what the outcome's going to be. If, you know, in, in a year we're going to be run by Hitler. And to do that all with a day-to-day -day attitude of, I'm doing what I can, making the best of it, and going forward. And that brings us down to the bottom of our barrel of barrel house. Looking back on her wartime radio days, Jean Ruth says her job as Beverly was all about diverting her audience for a few hours every day from the horrors of war. I, I didn't want to express sympathy, and so we just, we were happy and had a lot of fun. Did you know how important you were? Yes, the jobs that the women did. I think every part of it was absolutely essential. This is Beverly saying adios and I'll be seeing you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Ahead, remembering the Reagan wit. As Henry VIII said to each one of his six wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> so my mother, uh, we had a joke, my brothers and I, about my mother that um, if she had been on the Titanic and as, as, as it was going down, she would have turned to somebody next to her and said, I think dinner is going to be late tonight. <laughs> because she had, she had a very positive attitude, sometimes annoyingly so. Um, so you can see, I, I wanted to show you that so that you actually got voices and, and, and got to see women talking. And those, both of those women, sadly, have, have died. Um, and I felt like this was so important to make sure you know, that we caught that. And also as I talk, uh, when I went and talked about this book, my favorite thing was when men would show up with their mothers and stand up and say, this is my mother and here's what she did in the war. So that was kind of my mission. Um, but you know, there are, it, as I said, it was a time of change. I said it was an inadvertent revolution. Um, but there are so many roles that we don't know about and that we really haven't learned about and that were so pivotal and so what I'd like to do with the rest of my time, I have about 20 minutes, and I would, I would, I'm going to try and do f uh, questions, but I'd, I might not have time, but I'm going to talk on Friday also. So there'll be time, I, I, and I'll talk to you after. Um, I started with the three roles that we're familiar with. The war wife, the Rosie the Riveter, and Hollywood women. You know, we think about the pinups and all the things that Hollywood women did during World War II. Um, Lana Turner, Betty Grable, uh, but it was also, well, so it was the first time that married women outnumbered single women in the workforce. That was one thing. Um, 
it was also interesting to me when I started looking at the Hollywood women, um, the, the most famous women of World War II that we think of always are actually fake. Um, Rosie the Riveter is not a real person. They, there's a big controversy. There are three different women who say that it was based on them. But it was created, and I s talk about this, it was a very deliberate propaganda uh, tool to create this woman because before the war, during the Depression, women were discouraged from working and they were taking a job from a man. And then suddenly they realized we needed women, so they had to change the whole mindset of the country and say, how do we do that? So they created this, you know, the we can do it, right? Well, if you look at her, she has fingernail polish, she has eye makeup, she has lipstick. I don't think many men in the factories had to do that. <laughs> and all of the cosmetic ads in the, in the, in the um, magazines at the time, they all emphasize that their cosmetics will keep you soft and pretty for when your husband comes home from war. So there was a lot of pressure on women, a lot. And we don't give them credit for all that they put up with, in my opinion. But, you know, th th there are nicer ways to say it. Um, <laughs> and then the... Um, most famous woman in America, I think it was Fortune magazine, did a, did a um, not the most famous, the most popular woman, did a survey, and the most popular woman in America was Betty Crocker, and then Eleanor Roosevelt. And she wasn't a real woman, okay? And then, if you remember the pinups, and Betty Grable, I mean, she was the famous pinup, and we've all seen, I won't do the pose, but um, <laughs> there are certain things women over 50 just shouldn't do. Um, and so uh, she was the highest paid, the, one of the highest paid women in America during World War II. And she sort of embodied the contradictions because she was supposed to be the girl next door, she was married, then she was a sex symbol, but then she was the highest paid woman in America. So it's a really interesting thing to look at just the images. So to me, those first three chapters are kind of putting real people to the images that we've all known and that we think of. And it's always kind of dismissed. It's the women behind the men, all of that. That's, that's not how I did it. And then I got into some of the things we don't know, which um, one is that you might know this, but to really think about it and, and explore it, uh, World War II was the first time American women were allowed in the military. I say allowed because there were women who served roles but were not given the title, which is familiar to many of us, um, but they were not legally allowed to serve. But because World War II was the first war in which women had the right to vote, and then women were in Congress and even in the cabinet, uh, it became, there, there was a, a, a law passed during World War II and it allowed women in the military. However, when somebody gives you something and then they take it away with the other hand, um, women in the army during World War II were not allowed to carry guns or use guns. Women in the Navy were not allowed on ships. And women in the Air Force were only allowed to fly planes in U.S. airspace in a war that was fought overseas. So there were still limitations. And that's a really interesting thing to look at um, how an institution built for, by, and about men had to open up. And there were all sorts of stories of the, what the women had to endure. And as my mother alluded to in her letter, they were called all sorts of horrible names and thought of as wanton women, you know, all sorts of things like that. So it's a really interesting time. But I think there's one letter in the book, and I have rarely gotten through this without choking up a little bit. I don't know what it is about this letter, but it gets to me. And I'd like to read it. It's just an excerpt, or excerpt, a short excerpt. Um, this is a woman who was in the wax, the army. And she, well, I'll just read you how I set it up. Within weeks of D-Day, in June 1944, wax were sent into France for the first time. On August 6, 1944, Patricia Rand McGalliard wrote to her family in Ohio about her life on the brink of the battle. We are now somewhere in France. We're bivouacked in tents in an apple orchard and are rapidly learning what the term field conditions really means. It's definitely on the rough side. But none of us mind very much. We're getting pretty used to accepting whatever comes our way. We're living three women to a tent, 
We wash in our helmets and sleep in our clothes. The nights are freezing cold. It's getting towards fall. We just begun to receive our mail again, thank goodness. It's so important to us. Time for bed now, so I'll close. I think of you all constantly. You're so very dear to me. I'm not afraid. Really, I'm not. I know God is taking care of me and mine and all. So, um, I don't, I, as I said, that always just gets to me. And what it is, is that's a letter we think of from a man. That's a letter we've heard many, many times. But to think of a woman and to think of how at home she wasn't thought of as doing that and never really given credit for doing that. I think it's really profound, and I was moved many times in doing this. Um, the other part of this is there are a lot of groups of women that I wrote about who this was a really contradictory time. I think it was contradictory for women in general, but um, less well-known stories. Uh, African-American women, the chapter on African-American women is called Jane Crow. And that comes from a woman named Pauli Murray, who was actually a fairly famous uh, feminist and helped start the National Organization for Women now. But in, in the 40s, and during World War II, she was in college at Howard University. And then in 1944, she applied to law school at Harvard, and she, didn't, she wasn't admitted. And it wasn't because she was black, it was because she was a woman. And they didn't allow women at Harvard Law School in World War II. So she ended up going back to ha Howard, got her law degree, graduated first in her class, and ended up in 1963 getting a PhD in law from Yale. So, <laughs> um, but that just shows you that, again, you know, uh, African American soldiers were segregated from white soldiers, and women were segregated from men, and black women were segregated from white women. So it, it was really complicated. Um, and another story which really gets me is Lena Horne. You've all, everybody knows Lena Horne. Lena Horne was really pioneering, and especially during that time, she had in her contract that she would not play a maid. Um, she really uh, was just, just an amazing performer, and she got involved with the USO, as many actresses did, and actors at the time. And so in, uh, Somewhere midway through the war, she was performing at a USO camp, Camp Ry or Fort Riley, Kansas. And she was t uh, to perform at e in the evening, and she was told that she would perform that evening for the white soldiers, because the black soldiers were not allowed in the, uh, un in the auditorium on the base. And that in the morning, really early, in the mess hall, she'd perform for the black soldiers. And she begrudgingly agreed. And she said, one of the things she said is that segregation was just so inconvenient. <laughs> and so that morning she got up and went and she peeked out to look at the audience. And she saw the black soldiers, but the first three rows were white people. And she said, who's that? White men. She said, who's that? Oh, that's the German POWs. So the German POWs, because they were white, sat in front of the black American soldiers. She was so angry, she refused to perform, and she marched out and went to the NAACP office locally and met a woman named Daisy Bates, who was a very famous civil rights worker and um, involved in the Little Rock school segregation. And that was it. She quit the USO, and she had enough money, and she financed her own tours, and she performed for all soldiers. So. Those are some amazing stories. There's lots of others. I, I heard Meg Wolitzer earlier saying to condense something like this into a short talk is, is challenging, but I'm up for it. Um, <laughs> another thing is Japanese-American women. Um, you know, they were often bearing the brunt of the camps that they were sent to. And I happened to be able to speak to one of the women who was in, she was a young girl, a young woman in San Francisco, and she and her three sisters and her parents were sent to a camp. They had to close down their flower shop that they owned, and somebody took their dog, and she ended up in Chicago. But I just want to read you the way she talked about it, because again, their voices are, to me, what makes this so 
special. Um, her name was Akiko Mabuchi Toba. Uh, and she said, years later, people still wondered why her generation, and the women in particular, appeared so passive in the face of the internment. She said it was important for everyone to understand they were not being complacent at the time. Instead, they believed they were displaying a steely kind of defiance. It was their sole option in those times, given the racial climate of the country and what had been ingrained by them, in them by their parents. And these were their parents who had immigrated from uh, Japan. Our generation, this is her, our generation was raised never to call attention to ourselves, to work twice as hard as others, and above all, never to bring shame to the family. We had a strict upbringing, and women in particular were never to cause any waves in society. I think it was because our parents were having enough trouble at the time making their way in America and showing their loyalty, and they didn't want us to make it harder. So when the war broke out, the only thing we felt we could do was go behind the barbed wire to prove we were loyal. I lost three years of my life, and my parents lost everything they had built up over the years. But I sure hope we proved it. Um, and so, there again, this was a time of much contradiction. And while our country was fighting a noble fight, I happen to believe, we were also creating some pretty innoble, unnoble, not noble things. Innoble, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it was also a time for professional women, journalists, doctors. There were opportunities that came up. It was the first time women were allowed to report on the war from a war zone. Um, and then in politics, as I mentioned, it was, it was when the first time women had had the right to vote. And I want to uh, quote from, uh, I'll read to you about Jeanine Rankin, Jeanette Rankin, who was the first woman ever elected to Congress. Um, she was a congressperson from Montana, and she was actually elected in 1917 before women had the right to vote, because in Montana they did. And so she came, and she was the first woman. And for World War I, she voted against World War I because she was a pacifist. And she was the only person in Congress in World War II to vote against World War II after Pearl Harbor. And what she said on the, um, here's how I, Alluding to the fact that in 1941, women still were not allowed in the military, she stood up and said, as a woman, I can't go to war, and I refuse to send anyone else. Then she cast the lone nay vote, the only politician to register any objection to going to war on either the House or Senate floor that day. Loud boos and hiss, hisses erupted. Minutes later, Rankin was forced to lock herself in a phone booth just outside the chamber for her own protection against the mobs jeering at her. From there, she called the Capitol Police to escort her back to her office, where she locked herself in for safety. That's a kind of courage that we don't think about. Um, you know, and we celebrate a lot of people when they have the courage of their convictions. So it's an interesting um, moment there as well. Um, and then, not all of the women, just like any humans, were perfect or good, or um, some were even allied with people besides America, or places besides, countries besides America. Um, there, I wrote about what I, I have a chapter called The Wrong Kind of Woman, and I wrote about gay women, I wrote about women who were sort of thought of as outside. And then I also wrote about some women who um, were looked down upon, but I looked at them as well in a new way. Um, in Hawaii, the US government, there was a US government sponsored, essentially, brothel. And there were women uh, sent from San Francisco who were sex workers, and they were there to service the men and it was run by the government. The Hawaiian police kind of let it happen. And in World War I, more uh, men died from venereal disease than from the bullets of the war. 
And so it was thought, and the way that women were portrayed was that women were the carriers. Women, you know, they never talked about how a woman got it, where who she got it from. But it was the women who were the carriers. There's a famous poster that said, she may look clean, but... And then there was one with Hirohito, Hitler, and then a skeleton in an evening dress. And it said, the worst of the three. <laughs> so um, let me just uh, uh, give you a little taste of the women in Hawaii who um, were involved with this. It's called, it was called Hotel Street. Um, The approximately five-block area of the Hotel Street District was a hub of social activity for military men in Honolulu, and Honolulu was a hub of the Pacific Theater for Americans. During the war, more than 30,000 people a day visited the Hotel Street District. Bars, tattoo parlors, souvenir stands, cheap restaurants, and places to have a picture taken with a native woman in a hula skirt were everywhere. They were American women also. And so were brothels. About 250,000 men visited the Hotel Street brothels each month, paying $3 for three minutes with a woman. That translated to at least a $9 million per year industry. There were approximately 250 prostitutes operating in about 15 brothels on the street. And then I said that they were white women sent from uh, San Francisco. Many women handled up to 100 men a day, at least three weeks of every month. There was a curfew in place at night in Honolulu, so the brothels were open from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Men could often be seen lined up around the block, waiting to go up the stairs to the second floor prostitution houses. And then it goes on, but it was a regulated system. So there are many other voices that I would love to share with you of women during that time. There were journalists, spies, wives of the scientists in Los Alamos who never knew what their husbands were doing until after the war. Um, but I'm going to end with my mother again, uh, talking about, I, I found, when I, when I finished this, I really wanted to talk to her, and I found a speech that she had made in 1971 uh, in Memphis, where we were living, uh, to a church group, and it was called The Humanization of Emily, and that's me, and um, it was about women's liberation that was taking over the country, and I was in the audience, I was nine, I do not remember it, but <laughs> um, what she said, she, she, I, I say she, uh, she talked about how family history is so important when talking about women's history, and this is my mother. The history of women is much like the history of black people in this country. It's never been recorded. All of our history has been written by men, for men, and about men. The women were simply the auxiliaries, the ladies' auxiliary. And the only kind of history we have of the part women played in the building of the country is, and of the world for that matter, is family history. And then she told a story of my grandmother, or her grandmother, my great-grandmother, uh, in the West and putting out a of prairie fire when her husband was away and saving their family and their farm and everything. And then, this is how I end my book and I'll end my talk. But it was the an anecdote my mother used to end her speech that day that gave me the almost spooky sense that I might have been destined to write this book all along. It was as if, whether or not I knew it, invisible forces were pushing me to expand my thinking and take a long, serious look at the women's point of view during World War II. That day, when I was nine, my mother, the former Red Cross girl, told a story that summed up the mission in my quest, even though it would be some 30 years before I realized it. And this is how my mom ended her speech. I was driving the car carpool, as I often do. This is one part of women's work I would not give up. And in the back seat, Emily and some of her friends were chattering. And I was thinking about the grocery list, as I do between other tasks, and suddenly, I heard some very interesting talk going on. This was several weeks ago. I heard them saying, daughter of a first aid kit, daughter of a first aid kit. And I said, Emily, what's that? And Emily said, well, you know, we play land of opposites at school. And there's this boy there who keeps saying, son of a gun, son of a gun. 
And so we say, daughter of a first aid kit. <laughs> well, I thought, here is the descendant of all the women in my family, the ongoing continuum. Here is this young female person. Maybe she'll get the chance. Maybe she'll know a day when the daughter of the first aid kit will be as valued in our society and our culture as the son of a gun.